This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Upon this episode we conclude our look at Filchie's Gates of Hell trilogy with the final instalment of House by the Cemetery from 1981. The review of that movie and my overall thoughts on this one, which have changed since the last time I reviewed this, so... What, we're going back about six years was the last time we went through the Gates of Hell trilogy and to be honest... Um, City of the Living Dead, it stuck pretty much at where it was graded wise. The Beyond will forever be my favourite of the three and always the, the one that is at the top. But House by the Cemetery was the one that was kind of the the black sheep of the group. And on this viewing, this time round, some of my opinions have changed. So you'll find out what those are after the first break. Before we get to that, quick update, we have one more planned episode before we kick into our 24 episode marathon from the 1st to the 24th of December. Back to back episodes dropping every single week until we close our doors over Christmas. So that last episode is our final part of the Amicus series. That one will be dropping tomorrow for your perusal and your pleasure. So, we're going to take a short break just now. You are going to see the trailer for House by the Cemetery when we return. Details, conversations, and more importantly, the review, coming right up right after this. to a widow who finds out her husband butchered his mistress and then took his own life. That's where Peterson hanged himself on that iron rail. a man like him slaughter the woman he loved and then hang himself? Well, I don't know. The human mind. Yeah, a research project on suicide with a researcher commits suicide. Don't go inside, whoever you are. Don't go inside. Someone's in here, Mommy! <laughs> There's someone down there! Get the door open! Where's the axe? Where's the axe? Keep away from the door! No, I will! Don't worry, Bobby. I'll get you out. Why? Who's there? 
within this house. Dr. Freudstein! And welcome back. So let's give you some details on House by the Cemetery. House by the Cemetery was directed by Lucio Fulci, based on the screenplay by Dardano Saracci, Giorgiano Moruso and Elise Bigrani. The movie itself stars uh, Catrona McCall, Pablo Marco, uh, Ania Perioni, Guana Fresa, Silvia Collatina, uh, we have Giovanni Di Nava, we have Carlo De Meo, we have Giovanni Fresa, and that is your lot. There is, of course, a little cameo from Lucio Fulci himself. Um, the synopsis is a New England home is terrorised by a series of murders, unbeknownst to the guests that a gruesome secret is hiding in the basement. So, of all the Gates of Hell trilogy, House by the Cemetery is the one that's most insular. It's kind of why I've changed my opinion about it over time, specifically on this watch. City of the Living Dead has world stakes, like there's like real world implications of this particular event happening in Dunwich and its effect that will spiral out from that point if our heroes don't save the day. It's kind of the same with The Beyond. The Beyond has a situation where underneath this hotel there is this kind of hellhole portal to, to oblivion there. And that's going to continue to spiral out as well, if not closed, right? So, with the last one, you would anticipate House by the Cemetery is going to be a similar scenario that, you know, the stakes could never be higher. Our heroes must save the day by, you know, ostensibly closing the portal and, you know, stopping hell from roaming the earth. And it kind of does. I mean, the portal does exist in the basement of all places, surprise, surprise. But the actual set up and execution of this movie falls more in line with a kind of gothic haunted house than it does with the the kind of zombie overtones of uh you know city of the living dead or a kind of action horror romp that would be something like the beyond this one is like as as most it is a haunted house it is a family this is the amityville this is a family moving into a clearly haunted house it's right beside the fucking cemetery. What we're we doing here? Clearly haunted house, and with all the warnings that child Bob, we'll get to Bob in a minute, uh, has uh, has been warned in advance from the girl weaving in the picture. Um, once we get in there, it is murders are happening, crazy stuff is going down, but it's for the most part confined to the house itself. We don't really travel far beyond that. Now, there's one way of looking at this. The easiest way of looking at it is budgetary. So we maybe don't have the same scope, a tighter time scale, and we want to kind of insulate that by having a relatively single set location that we can film the whole movie in and rattle through that. That kind of makes sense, kind of has that feel for sure. There's another part of it that feels that Fulci is such a diverse a director that this kind of makes sense. We get three different flavors of Filchie's back catalogue, all crammed in within a year and a half, with City of the Living Dead, his kind of new wave of French zombie style of filmmaking off the back of something like Zombie Flesh Eaters. Through the beyond, we get a little bit of that, but we also get those kind of psychic elements that you would use in movies in the 70s, like the psychic. And then you get this kind of haunted house story at the end, which you would do more of, actually, as we moved into... The, the kind of later 80s, that sort of became a, a like a recurring theme in some of his movies is the idea of haunted locations. So he's kind of, you're getting three flavours of Fulci here over the Three Gates of Hell, which I love. I mean, it's similar to what Argento did when he did the His Three Mothers trilogy. 
I mean, Suspiria is definitely not the same movie as Inferno. It's definitely not the same movie as Mother of Tears either. So you're getting those three different flavours. It's just Fulci managed to churn them out in a year and a half because that's the sort of director he was. In the past, elements I didn't think stood up were one, that insular um, kind of storytelling, that single set location, which actually in hindsight now I think actually aids it in, in great part. It allows it to feel a bit more intimate. actually builds the stakes for me. Like, having the whole world on the line, but only ever really seeing a couple of locations doesn't make me feel like the whole world is on the line. In the case of this one, the fact that we have a family in this house and we're, we're kind of invested in saving them is the big is the big selling point. It's the big thumbs up. It's the big thing that works. So... That, to me, is now a positive, where in the past it was a negative. Bob. We have to talk about Bob. Uh, much has been said about Bob. Uh, I've led a lot of the hatred online about Bob. Uh, if you don't know what Bob is, uh, or who Bob is, Bob is the young boy in this movie who is horribly dubbed in, uh, in the English language version to this kind of high-pitched, shrilled, annoying voice. It has a very cinematic face. Um... Uh, there's a lot of symmetry in it, and it has this kind of blank, almost doll-like face, which, if you're a cinematographer, you fucking love capturing that, because it looks amazing. If you're the audience, coupled with that um, overdubbed voice, it becomes in incredibly irritating. I've actually softened a bit to Bob on this watch as well, which, trust me, no one expected me to say that less than me right now, but I kind of softened it. I kind of like the performance, that he is the innocence of this movie. And let's be honest, innocent people are no fun, ever. They are the, 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 the clammy, wet sponge uh, in your bed that you didn't know that was there. And then you go in, and then all of a sudden you just feel miserable. He, he is he's that sort of character, but actually it kind of works dynamically with the family. The rest of the family are borderline hysterical, and he is this kind of you know, dead behind the eyes, doll-like eyes, kind of, like, face, just, like, for the majority of the movie. It weirdly worked for me this time. I still won't go as far as to say I like the character. I don't like the character, but his actual placement in the movie works a lot more for me. This is a Filchy film, so you get some gnarly gore. And I actually think it's, it's maybe not the best of the three from that one, but this one starts to ebb much more into slasher territory, which, you know, he would do more of specifically in the in the the movies that come right after this, whether it's something like Manhattan Baby, which has that combination of the supernatural and slasher, or New York Ripper, which comes close at the heels of this. I think New York Ripper and Manhattan Baby are pretty much the one-two punch that you get after this. Um, and the, he has a nasty streak in his slasher stuff that he films, and it's in here, and it's in here, and it's really, really well. You know this is a different sort of movie when the first kill happens right in the cold open and it is a knife going into the back of someone's head. It's, you know, at that point, it's a different sort of movie from the previous two. It handles it really well. The effects are super cool. Uh, the mad doctor in the basement, his his makeup is fucking unsettling. It's like he's like a kind of weird Nazi SS Frankenstein doctor. Uh, with a kind of molten, melting gas mask on his face. It really, really, really works. Um, I know some people aren't overly keen about the ending. I would argue that this ending has maybe the happy ending, quasi-happy ending, that none of the other Against the Hell movies actually have, and with this one being the closing of that one, uh, this trilogy overall, I actually think it kind of weir weirdly ends on a kind of quasi-optimistic note without necessarily being bells, whistles, happy, like high fives and, you know, we did it! You, you don't get that here. Fabio Frizzi's score, a, a different tone again, so you're getting three scores from Frizzy back to back on this one. And this one has, it has the same sort of imminence and kind of almost semi-church operatics, but at the same time, it is much more measured than the other two. It doesn't go nearly as scatty as um, City of the Living Dead or The Beyond. It's actually more measured, which keeps in tone with the overall production, which feels more measured, more in control. Like I say, my guess would be it was budgetary. Uh, performances out with that are really good. Katrona McCall, we've already seen her 
before and she can deliver the part very very well she's doing a slightly different role here and this is a like back to back one two hit with Fulci so that's kind of cool to see and just overall I found myself at the end of this one kind of feeling better about it than I had in the past. For me, City of the Living Dead and the Beyond were always pretty much at the five star. You know, absolutely loved them. And then you would drop down to a four when you came to House by the Cemetery, if you were me. I'm going up a point five on this one this time. I genuinely had a lot more fun with this. I feel I got it a little bit more. And I've seen that a few times, but nowhere near as much as the other two. And I actually think of doing this in the format we have and put myself in that headspace has allowed me to appreciate more of what the movie actually does manage to get right, which is a lot more than I originally gave it credit for. I actually think across the board this is probably the more solid of the three entries in terms of construction, storytelling and delivery. Um, the Beyond goes a bit crazy at times and sometimes the effects don't hold up. City of the Living Dead will always have that ending which makes no sense. But at least in this one, I kind of felt like all the component parts came together, which made it feel more enjoyable, narratively speaking. So yeah, overall, I'm coming up on this movie. Surprise a fucking prize. I'm giving this one a 4.5, and I don't hate Bob as much as I used to, but I still hate Bob. We are probably counting down to some 4K UHD release of this one in the relatively quick horizons. Um, it was obviously with Arrow, for the original release. I don't know who has the rights to it now, but I suspect we won't be far from getting that. My uh, my interest in Arrow would say I would love to keep it with Arrow, and that way you have all three of them with the same company, but if a uh, second site or any eight films got their hands in it and want to do the goods in it, I would happily buy it as well. Would love to see it in 4K UHD. And there you go. So the ordering of my favourite to least favourite in the Gates of Hell trilogy should surprise absolutely no one and has remained unchanged. The Beyond is at number one, City of the Living Dead is at number two, and House by the Cemetery is at number three. But to be honest, as a viewer, you're spoiled by all three. There ain't a bad one in here at all. Thank you very much for taking some time out to check out this review of House by the Cemetery, closing out our mini-series on the Gates of Hell trilogy. Of course, we will do more of these reviews um, in the new year, but we have a jam-packed month of podcasts ahead of us through December. So tomorrow we'll close out our Amicus series, and then on Friday, the 1st of December, you are getting a five-hour episode of Podcasts Under the Stairs with myself, Doug Tilly, and Bo Ransdell sit down and do our annual director's conversation. On that episode, we're looking at the movies from Brian De Palma from 1968 to 1980, concluding that run on Dress to Kill. It is an epic, awesome conversation. And if you're interested in cinema, auteurs in cinema, or just, like, three guys discussing the greats, then check that out. There's a whole lot of rough filmmaking in that one. I don't think a lot of people understand how rocky the start was for De Palma. So in terms of his career, he was around for a while before he got a movie where everyone was like, yes, this is De Palma. This is what I want. So we're going to cover all that. That drops on Monday the 1st. Then you're getting basically episodes right up to Christmas Eve uh, covering a myriad of stuff, but predominantly the NPC series looking at the Silent Night, Deadly Night remake, Silent Night from 2012. To make sure you don't miss any of that on YouTube, hit subscribe and hit that like button. Leave some comments down below. Let me know what you made of House by the Cemetery. Do you have a particular favourite ordering of the Gates of Hell trilogy? Is it the same as mine? Is it different? Let me know in the comments. If you are checking us out through Spotify or Anchor as a video podcast, there's a question that will appear at the end. Please answer that question it's always great to hear from you but make sure you subscribe to the feeds there and if you're listening to us, any of the podcatchers out there hit subscribe as well that way you get access to the about 1300 episodes of podcasts under the stairs that are now available for you but on top of that as well you'll never miss anything else that i put out like i said december is going to be busy so all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for checking out this episode wherever you are what the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours please take care of yourselves out there this is duncan mcleish broadcasting live from under the stairs and i am signing off